Hello everyone and I hope you've all been keeping well and managed to find a new equilibrium and a new sense of stability in these very unique and uncertain times that we're all facing. I must admit doing a lecture remotely, recording it in my loft, hoping that my children don't walk in unannounced and make me start it all from scratch is quite a surreal experience and I apologise if the slides are not as colourful as they might be but given the constraints I prefer to focus on the content. So citizenship has been so much at the centre of our debates and experiences recently and when I first started to think about the content for this lecture some months ago I was sure that we would want to ponder over Brexit, debate over the pros and cons of being EU citizens, what right it might endow us with, um, like freedom of movement of people and goods, what obligations, like accepting the free movement of people and goods um, into the UK. And the outcome of the referendum on leaving the EU has certainly re-energised the push for independence in Scotland, and all of this, of course, is a good illustration of the complexities of citizenship and belonging and which scale they are felt at. Now these debates of course are still very important and relevant and I hope at least some of you take the opportunity to look into them in more depth. But something else has preoccupied us all very directly for several weeks now, the COVID-19 pandemic. So I've been thinking a lot about so many of the potential links that the topic of citizenship has with the unfolding COVID-19 crisis. And I felt that it would be inappropriate to simply prepare the lecture as if nothing was happening. So I'll spend the first part of the lecture reflecting on how ongoing action or inaction by states and supranational coalitions places certain expectations, duties, responsibilities on citizens and conversely, how we as citizens of particular states may place expectations upon our national governments to act to protect our welfare, because this is, after all, um, at the core of what citizenship is. So I'll combine this with some initial thoughts about how to define citizenship. And then in the second part, we'll look further into definitions of citizenship and how they've evolved and how they may be broadened. In the third part, we'll turn to China so that we may look more closely at one specific example of how citizenship is governed negotiated and contested in a non-Western context, very much in, in the spirit of globalising the curriculum. So if we pick up any textbook and look for a definition of citizenship, we'll find it is about both citizens' responsibilities to a state and conversely, that state's responsibility to protect its citizens. Now, I'd recommend you turn to Yarwood's introductory piece on citizenship for some crucial points about how to understand citizenship. He explains citizenship allows access to basic rights, such as education or welfare benefits. It allows you to move across and between countries. Being a citizen also may foster a feeling of belonging or even a sense of duty, a desire to serve a wider community. Citizenship is geographical. It's something that is only given meaning when it is put in a spatial context. You are a citizen of a place, whether it's a recognised country or an informal community. But citizenship also operates at the higher scale of the global. We may feel we are citizens of the world when we think of our responsibilities in tackling global issues like climate change or unfair trade. At the same time, local places and sites are the most common context for us to take action as citizens, for us to experience citizenship. But for the most part, as Yarwood notes, citizenship operates in the background of life until it is undisturbed. We don't spend much time thinking about what being a citizen means or how our actions may or may not be part of our duties and rights as citizens unless those rights are threatened. Many of us are lucky enough to hold passports that allows us to travel fairly seamlessly to many parts of the world, perhaps. Um, we took that right for granted until many borders closed last month due to COVID-19, and most national governments urged their citizens to avoid all but any essential travel. 
Crucially then, as Yarwood notes, when citizenship becomes an active point of contention, it can provoke activism of many sorts, whether in demanding voting rights or the right to healthcare and education, or more relevant to the current situation, the right to be compensated for loss of earnings or be provided for by the state if the lockdown means that we find ourselves unable to secure an income. Just as crucially, citizenship is far from a fixed category or concept, but it's rather contested and fluid. So some citizens may feel that they as citizens ought to be entitled to types of welfare and protections that the state may not be granting them. In the age of coronavirus, protection may come in the shape of restrictions. Many have reacted with dismay, for instance, at Trump's negligence or Johnson's for that matter, in the earlier stages of the pandemic, at their reticence and refusal to enforce stricter social distancing measures or to impose a lockdown. Others conversely may have felt or may still feel that there are civil liberties, which are also at the essence of citizenship in liberal democracies, have been violated by the latest imposition of lockdown measures. So this brings us, brings us to the most basic question surrounding citizenship. Who counts as a citizen? And this, of course, is very closely tied to debates around inclusion and exclusion. So if we turn to John May's um, excellent summary on exclusion, he points out that exclusion is simultaneously material and symbolic, the two mutually reinforcing each other. Exclusion is also an active process, and this refers to the deliberate distancing of an, of an individual or group by and from another individual or group. It's irretrievably intertwined with processes of inclusion, so we can't think of one without thinking of the other. It also operates across multiple axes, whether of class, gender, race, ethnicity, sexuality, age, mental or physical health, and so on, and often acts across more than one such axis at any one moment. Finally, processes of exclusion are never absolute and will always, to some extent, be resisted. Now, COVID-19 illustrates all of these dimensions extremely well. Indeed, nations' actions in the wake of the pandemic are very much about who is included and who is excluded, who is protected and how that protection ought to be administered. As Malik wrote recently in The Guardian, when Donald Trump reportedly offers millions of billions of dollars to a German company to create a vaccine to be used exclusively for Americans, when Germany blocks the export of medical equipment to Italy, when Britain, unlike Portugal, refuses to extend to asylum seekers the right to access benefits and healthcare during the coronavirus crisis, each does so in the name of protecting a particular community or nation. And this, of course, relates directly to how we define citizenship. Who states and supranational organizations like the EU accepts responsibility for and declares worthy of protection is one clear way of defining citizenship. Now, spatiality and its relationship to citizenship are most clearly illustrated by states' reactions in the wake of coronavirus. National borders have been closed, people have attempted to return to the country of residence, and different countries weighed their response against different models of responsibility to the population, with China, South Korea and Italy going for a strict approach quite early on, Italy imposing fines by mid-March to enforce isolation, while the UK embraced this model only later, and we could argue after some pressure both by experts and the international community ultimately closing schools on March 20th until further notice. And I, as you can imagine, um, as a mother of two, um, check upon um, school closures fairly frequently. We were told that reluctance to close the schools earlier was in an effort not to put pressure on families, some of whom, of course, would have members working on uh, for the NHS. Ultimately, 
the government decided after some pressure from experts that closing schools and imposing a lockdown would be necessary in order to avoid overwhelming the NHS at a later date. So you can see here already there are quite a few different turns into how um, the state strategies for protecting its citizens and, and therefore for defining its obligations to its citizens vary during a time of crisis and vary across different states. Now, the lockdown requires us to behave in particular ways. It defines our duties as citizens as stay at home, protect the NHS, the NHS save lives. We hear this every day, several times a day. Before the lockdown, our duty as citizens in relation to COVID-19 were just to wash our hands. Our responsibility was limited, but in that same way, so was the responsibility of the state. We were told that herd immunity was the goal. Johnson defiantly claimed that he would still continue to shake hands. And just as he required citizens to keep a social, social distance of two meters from others, he was clearly breaking this rule himself during the briefings. As evidence from Italy became increasingly worrying and scientists from Imperial College gave clear warnings about the dangers of doing nothing, it became clear that if the government was to be able to fulfill its duties to its citizens, it would have to take tougher action. Conversely, this made tougher demands on citizens, initially about social distancing, but soon enough after um, soon after about staying at home, working remotely if possible, caring for children who could no longer attend school. Those in vulnerable groups and the over 70s were asked to self-isolate for 12 weeks. So you can see that there are, again, different obligations for different age groups of citizens in the UK and different ways in which the state pose as caring, uh, the state poses as caring for those citizens. Now, lest we forget, not everyone is staying at home. And those working are not only those employed by the NHS, but also those employed in key sectors like food delivery or bin collection. As ever, the dangers of contracting the virus are not evenly spread. For those in key sectors, fulfilling their duties as citizens means being in the difficult position of having to break the social distancing rule in, in some uh, situations and put themselves at risk of contagion. Whereas for those who are not in that sector, our, our duties as citizens are stay at home, protect the NHS, save lives. But let's think beyond the UK for a moment. In India, the lockdown was imposed with only hours of warning, and this triggered an exodus of migrants trying to reach their hometowns. Regulations about social distancing are impossible to implement in slums where toilets are shared by many families and where the spatial arra arrangements um, for living um, arrangements for families are by definitions in close proximity to one another. So you can see that in different contexts, even the ability to implement what the state is mandating as our duties as citizens may in fact be uh, unrealistic. In the early days back in January, coronavirus could be examined at a safe distance. We could see it as China's problem. Indeed, uh, Trump called it the China Chinese virus. And we could snigger perhaps at the utter absence of civil liberties as a city, a province and a nation of well over a billion people were effectively frozen to the spot with police blocks and drones to monitor and ensure nobody broke the rules. From the biggest cities to small villages, officials were tasked with ensuring that people did not move around. The official death toll of just over 3,000 people is flouted by China as clear evidence that authoritarianism works better to keep people safe. And China's apparent success with curbing contagions and deaths has been mobilized to inject patriotism, which will be no doubt needed to face the economic challenges ahead. Citizenship here is about putting the individual self always after the well-being of the nation and accepting restrictions because they produce a common good. Ironically, or worryingly, similar sentiments seem to be surfacing in Italy. Italy was the first country to be severely hit in Europe 
and as an Italian, I followed developments there closely and worried about my relatives, my ability to travel back, should any of them become ill. The proliferation of patriotic sentiments early on during the lockdown was striking. People blasting out the national anthem from rooftops, waving national flags, producing videos about their national pride in how they were doing the right thing, while observing in bewilderment as other nations, the UK and US in particular, seemed to dismiss the need for strong action. The pride in being Italian which surfaced at this time was something I had not observed in my lifetime. I'd recommend that you read Letizia Bonanno's piece on Italians' desires for an authoritarian state in the wake of COVID-19. I've included a quote here, um, which, as you can see, makes clear a shift towards a desire for a daddy state, a strong man in power. And as you can see, this is a very specific type of citizenship arising or out of exceptional circumstances, to use um, Agamben's terminology. Now, populist tendencies have been on the rise globally before COVID-19, but as any crisis, the current one may represent an opportunity for those who advocate ultra-rightist politics to gain support in the name of the common good. This would result in a radical redefinition of what it means to be a citizen, citizen one that I think is, it is our duty as citizens to be vigilant about so that it doesn't happen without our noticing. Now, through the lens of coronavirus and with reference to examples from the UK, but also briefly Italy and China, we've reflected on the many, many ways in which citizenship is defined through inclusion and exclusion, and in terms of obligation and rights. Now, crucially, how citizenship has been defined and practiced has varied over time and space, reflecting a state's political and social history. And this is why it's important to step back from a Eurocentric, state-centric, contemporary day focus and to look at how citizenship has been defined, experienced, contested, in different places at different times. If you look at Yarwood's chapter again, he provides very good starting points and brief examples, but ultimately it's important that, look, that we look more closely at specific case studies in depth to understand these diversities and complexities. And we'll do this as, as we turn to China later in the lecture. Before that, I want to spend some time broadening the definition of citizenship, because citizenship is about more than who, who is or who isn't a member of a country and the rights and duties associated with them, that membership. It's also something more subjective and interpersonal or relational. It's a social glue that binds people to each other and to a territory. It promotes a feeling of belonging, identity, duty and entitlement. So cultural citizenship, for instance, is one way in which we can broaden the definition of citizenship and draw attention to how globalized flows of ideas and cultures may forge transnationally shared cultures or codes based, for instance, on faith, on politics or ethnicity. Think um, as an example of Islam as the basis for a shared global brotherhood. Or think of ethnic minorities whose area of residence spans across national borders. So citizenship can be built on a sense of shared belonging to a vulnerable or marginalised community, both through experiences of exclusion and of self-exclusion. Goodwin, for instance, um, draws attention to gay communities as an example of communities who feel excluded from particular spaces and make an effort to craft, to craft alternative spaces and cultures. I recommend you to consult the work of our own Carl Bonner Thompson on gay communities for some examples of this as well. As Goodwin puts it, in these spaces we can see the flowering of an alternative culture which can act as the basis for an alternative kind of citizenship in which members of certain groups can establish rights and obligations 
to each other. And most of us don't think about citizenship that frequently. And yet, many of the things we do every day or the places where we interact, study and work are related to being citizens in one way or another. Landscapes, for instance, articulate citizenship through um, the presence of public monuments, national flags, war memorials, public buildings, and so forth. Institutional spaces uh, like schools, youth groups, can also be central to shaping our sense of citizenship and what it is to be a good citizen. But citizenship is also about what we do in our daily lives, our everyday experiences. And as a consequence, geographers have also pushed for um, more studies looking beyond central political spaces into everyday spaces and marginal spaces. And there's been a spatial shift towards that, looking at seemingly mundane spaces like shops, parks or schools. But also crucially, it's pushed us to think about who is excluded from those public spaces um, or who is excluding themselves from those public spaces and particularly about the gap between the jury legal rights to inclusion and participation and de facto application and practices of those rights. Um, everyone has a right to walk around the streets late at night. It doesn't mean that everyone will do that and people of particular um, gender or uh, perhaps age will be less inclined to do that. Conversely, if we think about everyday practices and interactions in schools and homes and shops, nurseries and community groups, these can be vectors through which those who may feel marginalised otherwise can become more visible and more valuable citizens and feel more included in wider society. And while we often think of citizenship as something that is conferred at a national level, it's most often practiced through localities and through horizontal bonds. Indeed, increasingly, citizens are expected to have a duty to participate in their localities. Um, we've seen over the years, uh, recent years, in Western neoliberal democracies, encouragements to so-called active citizenship, um, to voluntary activities to provide or support local services. Think of Neighbourhood Watch, for instance. And in large part, this has been exacerbated by cuts to public spending. So if we look at Yarwood's work, you can um, see a summary of case studies on charity-run food, bank, food banks, but you can look at many more case studies um, beyond that. And of course, the impact of these reforms has been geographically uneven, reflecting differences in local participations and community leadership in different areas. So, as a common Chinese saying puts it, the child who cries gets the milk. And therefore, in other words, people in different areas are differently positioned to participate and for their participation to count, to be listened to. As a, an example that I've come across very recently, um, someone at my son's, my older son's school set up a crowdfunded initiative to raise funds for the local NHS trusts to provide workers with PPE or personal protective equipment. And through their social circles, they managed to raise thousands of pounds in only a few days. Well, the result is likely to have been different, perhaps, if a similar initiative had been promoted in a poorer area or by someone with a different kind of social um, circle. I recommend that you turn to Cloak and colleagues um, and their work on what they call ethical citizens, who they define as active citizens who are acting out of concerns rooted in their beliefs and their frustrations. And, and as they point out, importantly, it does not mean that they are apologists 
for the state's retreat. But to the contrary, their activities may be a form of resistance, drawing attention to gaps in welfare provision and challenging the state's policy. But citizenship is also about challenging state power and taking part in transnational networks, at least in part in response to the fact that multinationals have more power and wealth than many nation states. The growth of new social movements, for instance, reflect a feeling popularized in books like No Logo by Naomi Klein, that conventional politics is failing to fulfill citizens' political rights. And this is what some have um, termed activist citizens. Now, Yarwood draws on Parker to draw a useful analytical distinction between active and activist citizens. Active citizenship is about duties, it's about type, forms of volunteering that support the state and focus on changing neighbourhoods. Activist citizenship, uh, by contrast, uses local sites, but it's actually global in its concerns and reach. It relies on fluid alliances between diverse groups of people with various identities, affiliations and motivations. And the divide between active and activist citizenship, of course, needn't be a rigid one. This is a, a kind of a way to help us analytically to understand different forms of engagement and, and how they may be relating differently to, diff to, to the spatial scales of the local, the regional, the national, um, the global. And of course, both these forms of citizenship are contested and vary over time. As always, definitions such as activist citizen do not apply equally everywhere, nor do the strategies that they may resort to. So in some work that I've done with Tom Johnson and Lu Jixia on anti-incinerator coalitions in China, we showed that local activists in a village faced with the construction of an incinerator leaned on more professional urban campaigners and learned from them and from others who had previously successfully fought incinerators. But local and professional activists alike had to be very careful not to present their activities as a joined up, scaled up, national or even international effort to fight incineration everywhere. By contrast, they could only succeed if they focused on technicalities and practicalities. In the case we examined, for instance, the local activists managed to suspend the building of the incinerator because they uncovered that the public consultation required as part of the preliminary work had in fact been faked. The questionnaires that were included in the official documents included names of people that didn't live there or had died uh, several years before. Making a case against incinerators in principle or against dumping or pollution on rural and poorer areas, which was, of course, one of the key social and environmental justice concerns leading the activists, could not have succeeded and would not um, have led to um, uh, state support. And no doubt it would have attracted a crackdown. So the local campaigners, in order to gain the support of the professional activists from Beijing, had to reframe their concerns as not simply about their backyard or about compensation for loss of land, but about concerns with public health and justice. Only after doing this could they gain media attention, could they gain the support of a lawyer, could they gain um, the support of these more professional activists. But having gained that support, they had to strategically target um, and frame their um, complaints. Due to the increasing political tightening, in fact, the very same key activists, professional activi activists based in Beijing, who had been working on anti-incineration um, coalitions, disbanded and reformed around the refocused effort on zero waste and recycling. And, and the reason for that is that it's much less threatening. It's more about advocacy, about leveraging of local action and 
it's not contesting necessarily the state's stance on, on incineration. So this is all to say that activist citizenship may take different forms in different political contexts. And even within a particular context, it may change over time, as we've seen in this case, um, the ways in which the citizens framed their uh, loyalties, their concerns had to differ depending on who their counterpart was. Now let's talk a little further about forms of citizenship which, like activist citizenship, transcend the nation state. For some groups of people, wider opportunities to travel, work and live between states have led to what has been termed transnational citizenship that draws on the rights and identities of more than one country, um, as Elaine Ho writes. Transnationalism, as the name suggests, recognises that ideas and practices of citizenship cross national boundaries, flow between their borders, uh, and therefore are not confined by them. And we can think of the European Union as one example of that. Conversely, there has been growing resistance to this form of transnational um, citizenship. We can think again of the case of the European Union and Brexit in particular. Many states in the same spirit have sought to reassert national sovereignty and citizenship, placing quotas on numbers of migrants, selecting migrants through various processes, and in general, citizenship through these processes becomes stratified, with super rich, super mobile citizens, typically of the West on the one hand, and temporary and illegal immigrants uh, of migrants at the other end. Now these transnational practices and ideas may have opened the possibility for new spaces of citizenship as some of this work on transnational citizenship points out. But the right to be mobile continues to be denied to many and therefore we have to be cautious about um, how we talk about transnational citizenship and who is included or excluded by that definition. Our geographers are looking at how the emergence of notions of sustainable development and the sustainable citizen um, have led to the development of a stretched or distantiated mode of citizenship. And this includes a broadening across the globe, but also a sense of obligation towards future generations and the concern with environmental rights and responsibilities. And um, responsibilities not only to humans, but also to um, nature, the environment, non-humans. Similarly, for Kwame Anthony Appiah's um, we are citizens of the world because, as I quote, we live in an age of planetary challenges and interconnection between countries, from global warming to the refugee crisis, and the need has never been greater for a sense of shared human fate. So you can see here a rather different idea and definition of transnational or global citizenship. It's not about a privilege, it's about an obligation. But of course, individuals can be citizens at multiple scales at the same time. They can participate in one form of citizenship um, without being precluded from other forms of citizenship. So of course, all these points about citizenship being about more than the relationship between individuals and the state do not deny that the relationship between individuals and the state is crucial. And that is, a, uh, it of course varies in different states, and so do the possibilities for contesting it. So as we've already pointed out, citizenship of a state doesn't endow everyone with the same rights. So it's worth looking in some detail at China's household registration system as an example of how citizenship operates in China through inclusion and exclusion. Now, the People's Republic of China was founded in 1949 and 
With its founding, it created an invisible great wall between urban and rural areas, shrouded, um, as uh, Michael Dutton put it, in a thick feudal cloud. In other words, these uh, claims that the new China, communist socialist China, would break down any divisions, in fact, happened at the same time as a very clear division was um, increasingly ingrained into the fabric of socio-political economic life. And that's the divide between rural and urban China. Now, initially, freedom of movement was allowed for the first few years, but the government early on prioritized cities, seeing rural areas as sources of cheap grain that would support industry and support urban areas. So by 1955, the Household Registration Legislation or HUCO legislation was passed. And according to the system, everyone holds either a peasant or agricultural or Nongye HUCO, or by contrast, an urban or Chanzheng HUCO. And I use the word peasant here as a direct translation from Chinese, of course, being mindful of the derogatory nature of that term, both in Chinese and in English. Um, but it being also a term that refers to this administrative um, difference. So an agricultural Foucault entitles the holder to access to land, which provides for the subsistence, but it also ties that person to the land. So as I quote uh, from the Potters, membership was assigned at birth, it was inherited from the mother, and typically the mother would be the one with the uh, lower social status, and it couldn't be changed except under extraordinary circumstances. Now, an urban non-agricultural Foucault, by contrast, provided benefits in all spheres of life. It provided free subsidized health care, retirement benefits, food and housing. While peasants, rural residents, were left to fend for themselves. In the late 1950s, villages became collectivized to the point that even cooking um, couldn't, didn't take place in families but took, whole, uh, took place in canteens. Land was um, collectivized and therefore did no longer, no longer uh, belonged to individuals or to families. And going with that was a hardening of the Huko legislation. And this, in time, of course, consolidated social and economic disparities. Now, I wanted to share with you a picture of um, some of the flashy uh, Chinese cities or urban um, high-rise blocks, if you like, as an introduction into what happens next and to the China that we are seeing now. Now, after the death of Mao in 1976, the new leadership began to set out a series of social and economic reforms which involved decollectivizing the land and introducing a household responsibility system, according to which each individual was given a piece of land to guarantee their subsistence. And this was a welcome change because it meant individuals and families had more control over their own resources. However, the cost of living soon began to rise and it became clear that farming alone would be insufficient to meet these costs. From a bottom-up perspective, the system of huko tying the people to the land needed to be subverted. From a top-down macroeconomic level, the Chinese leaders also realized that a huge mass of surplus labor in the countryside could be mobilized to strengthen the economic growth, particularly by employing these laborers in industries and factories. The combination of these two factors meant that some migration from rural to urban areas became possible. So once again, then we can see that macroeconomic forces affect citizens' rights, that is the national urge to develop economically made it possible for rural residents to migrate in search of work. But at the same time, bottom-up push and pull factors meant that rural residents were eager to leave the countryside in search of an income. Crucially, however, the Hukou system remained. And this meant 
that rural migrants were effectively second-class citizens in urban areas. They resided there, but they didn't have the same rights to healthcare or other protection as those with an urban hukou. In effect, they were administratively invisible, still counting formally as rural citizens, but in reality residing in urban areas and fueling much of their development. From their point of view, this was still preferable to being stuck in, stuck in stagnant economic conditions in poor and remote villages where they could only secure basic living through agriculture and were increasingly unable to meet the rising living costs. Economic reforms then unleashed the peasant caste from the bonds of labour and land, but only to reintroduce restrictions that would ensure that they remained second-class citizens and became wage slaves in the booming cities along the coast. But reforms um, also produced conditions under which peasants' desire to earn in the city outweighed their fear of, of, of transgression. And I'd propose we see this as their way of contesting their second-class citizenship and striving for a better life. Both the resilient divide premised on the hukou and the efforts by some to overcome it, if not formally, at least in practice, through migration, have created an increased increasing polarization between the well-off and the extremely poor, the rural and urban areas between villages and within them. And yet these two nations of haves and have-nots, which had been kept separate by the Ma Maoist ban on migration, were now allowed to live side by side, causing deep tensions, of course, um, between them. Now, where once the system more or less foreclosed the possibility of movement into the cities and as a consequence produced a peasant caste, from the 80s onwards, money could buy you mobility and gave rise in a, in a way to different class considerations. By the mid 80s, the system, the hukou system was augmented by an individually based ID card system which was designed in theory to guarantee people's rights, but became another axis uh, for enforcing differential treatment and inequalities. And this entrenched growing social divisions. So vagrants, beggars, prostitutes, strangers, outsiders, distinguishable by what they are not, if we think back to earlier in the lecture, to inclusion and exclusion, are the products of this period of reforms. And these individuals, these migrants, are subjects in China to the most, most tragic human rights abuse, abuses. They are subaltern moving into the city. They are what the Chinese call Meng Liu, um, and this is a derogatory, derogatory term to mean those who travel blindly. And yet their travels are, of course, tactics to make the best out of that bad situation. They find themselves stuck in the city where work is limited, um, therefore taking on um, difficult work. And they find themselves trapped in a double pincer of freedom to sell labor, to move for work, and restrictions upon who can remain in the cities and um, what is an acceptable form of labor. So it becomes increasingly clear that citizenship isn't simply about the hukou or even the ID card, but it's about several forces of social stratification. The complexity here is that we have citizens who administratively are classed as rural and yet live in urban areas and strive to emulate urban lifestyles, buying a TV or more recently a car, contesting their citizenship and aligning themselves more in aspirations with urbanites, even though real urbanites may still shun them and look down on them. Through their presence, they've created different forms of belonging and citizenship in cities, through solidarity and camaraderie in factory dorms, by looking down on rural people and places that they've left behind and carving new spaces and places for themselves in the cities. <clears throat> 
establishing communities of their own through chain migration, setting up alternative schooling arrangements for their children who could otherwise not access um, urban schools. Now, all these are forms of citizenship based on a shared experience of exclusion from urban benefits, but also on shared aspirations, shared efforts to embody a different status through their lifestyle and consumption choices. They contest the citizenship conferred upon them at birth by the state by creating alternative spaces and solidarity, while they're also maintaining links and solidarities with at those left behind in the countryside. And what all these processes show us is that rural and urban areas are in fact complementary worlds. They are interdependent. Villages couldn't survive without the migrants. Inputs, um, cities also couldn't survive without the migrants' inputs. So we've established that citizenship in urban areas is contested, but the very same processes by, uh, which involve migration to urban areas and allow the diversification there also fuel diversification in villages. Now, villages with good connections to urban areas benefited especially from the reforms. Many became small capitalist market towns. And I'd recommend, if you're interested in this, that you look at the latest edition of the book Chen Village, which describes very well across uh, several years, decades, developments in this particular village. Conversely, remote villages benefited less from the reforms, continued to rely primarily on subsistence agriculture, or they became dependent on, on migrant remittances. Now, crucially, these changes have also challenged entrenched gender and generational imbalances. Um, Gao Mubo, for instance, in, in his book, showed that the fact that, and in fact many others in, in their own work on rural areas, showed that the fact that the major source of income is the younger generation in a family means that there's also a shift in, in the balance of power and increasing independence for the younger generation. Something similar has happened with gender and the fact that women have been able to live independently of their families, to earn an income and even keep some of it for themselves, meant that they have some newfound freedom. But we must also not romanticize um, this as a, as a kind of way out of patriarchal oppression, because more often than not, conditions in which they work are in fact poor and uh, the experience can be very isolating and, and damaging. I just thought I'd include a few pictures here of um, some of the conditions in which migrants live, work um, and travel. The picture on the top right is of some migrants as they travel um, to or from their, their place of um, work from their native villages or to their native villages. I'd also recommend if you have a chance that you take a look at the documentary Manufactured Landscapes, which um, is about the photographs taken by Ed Bortinsky, some of which are on um, factory dorms and factory floors in China. And they give you a really excellent um, front row seat on what these may look like. But I also wanted to include this picture, which I took um, 12 years ago, I think, in a rural tourist town, recently developed and recently relatively wealthy compared to what it would have been um, in previous years. And you can see in the back a newly opened restaurant. On the window is the character, the Chinese character for wealth, Fu. And right in front of it is an elderly woman carrying what seems to be a very heavy load. Mm, we can double guess from it that she's still cooking with um, wood burning stove rather than wood gas at home, which means she's fairly poor. Um, but also the fact that she's doing this um, rather than someone younger 
suggests that probably the younger generations in her family, as in most families, will have gone away in search for in search of um, waged occupations. Therefore, putting the pressure on the older generation to carry out the heavy burden of manual work at home, often alongside caring for um, grandchildren. Now, the proliferation of stratification and the efforts by migrants to contest their subordinate citizenship has, in time, began to blur the divide between rural and urban Foucault, or at least to make it more complex. One ironic twist here is the phenomenon of buying Foucault. During early reforms, agricultural tax and other levies were such a burden on rural population that those who could bought an urban Foucault to avoid paying these taxes. When I lived in a village during my PhD fieldwork in 2004 and 5, I heard many stories of this kind. Villagers had gotten into severe debt just to buy one family member, often a child, an urban hukou. And this meant that just as there were people with rural hukous living in cities, there were also people with urban hukous living in villages. Now, an extremely important change and challenge to the dual tier of rural urban citizenship has been affected by increasing migration, um, urbanization. A few years ago, China's population became, for the first time in history, in majority urban. But urbanization has also meant that, some, to some extent, the edges of the cities and countryside have been blurred, that there's been an increase in the number of new towns, and some former rural areas have been upgraded to the status of a town. Now, the systemically induced socioeconomic inequalities between rural and urban citizens that we've just heard about um, have also begun to change over the past um, 20 years or so after the um, come to power, the, the rise to power of Hu Jintao and, and Wen Jiabao in 2002. Rural residents have been increasingly granted benefits they didn't have before, like nine years of free education, membership of rural healthcare cooperatives, in part subsidized by the state, better infrastructure through an initiative called the Socialist Countryside, and more recently subsidies for um, electrical equipment and investment in poverty alleviation. So in recent years, restrictions on changing hukou have also loosened somewhat. And this means that the imbalance of rights secured through urban or rural citizenship has shifted to some extent. But of course, many inequalities remain. And rural to urban migrants are still very much second class citizens who often fend for themselves, whose status is precarious, and who just as often are moved on from their hard won settlements as cities expand and municipal governments appropriate the land on which they live and work, forcing them to move further out of the city. Carlo Invera di Ferri's work, I think, is brilliant in illustrating the hardships of some of these migrants, um, in his case, waste recyclers in the outskirts of Beijing, but also in illustrating their enduring efforts to exert agency, to claw back some control over their lives. And in fact, the very fact that they became waste recyclers was a way of exerting agency, as many have explained in their own life histories. Being a recycler is a way of becoming your own boss, of not having to work uh, long hours in a factory. And what all this illustrates is that while the power of the state is undeniable, the resilience and creativeness of these communities is a clear example of how citizens themselves are not just passive recipients of a top-down um, order, but they're incessantly creating better lives for themselves and their families. More broadly, I hope it will be clear as you read his uh, Carlos work that so many of the processes of negotiation and pushback by rural citizens that I've described today are also illustrations of the ways in which citizenship and the inequalities that it reinforces 
have been contested and in part challenged by migrants. Migrants can challenge urban citizenship not only because of their mixed status as urban residents without an urban registration, but also because their aspirations and strategies challenge expectations, forge new connections between rural and urban areas, even as they sometimes um, exacerbate the divide between them. So in conclusion, I hope that the initial thoughts on our current experience with coronavirus, the overview of different types of citizenship, and finally this detailed account of China's model of citizenship have given you some food for thought on the complexities of citizenship, the forces that shape it, the ways in which it varies across space and time, and the many ways in which it may be contested. Um, I've included here a quote uh, from Yarwood's chapter that I thought summarizes well some of the key points, the key aspects uh, surrounding citizenship that we've discussed today. I hope the lecture was interesting and that it may bring you some um, ideas to reflect also on your current experience of living in such a peculiar um, moment. Thanks very much.